Okay, we're going to get started. You're in the um, Tuberculosis and Mental Disorders Symposium, um, and thank you for coming. Um, it's uh, near the end of the conference, and uh, your, your uh, energy must be flagging a little. So we very much appreciate that taking the time, um, and we think we have a very interesting uh, set of presentations, and hopefully uh, a good discussion at the end of this. Uh, my name is Adam Carpati. I'm with the union's um, uh, New York office uh, called Vital Strategies. Um, uh, and um, I'll say a few remarks, and then uh, my, my colleague, uh, Knud Lonroth, will, um, will also make some remarks, and then we'll get right into the, um, right into the, uh, the sessions. So this is the, uh, we've been doing um, dedicated um, sessions abstract or symposium around uh, the intersection of mental disorders and tuberculosis. Um, it was, there had been some in the past at union conferences, but I think this is the third one we've done um, in a row now. Um, and I think it reflects um, our efforts um, at the union and with colleagues to start to highlight these issues, these important comorbidities, um, um, and talk about the science, the epidemiology, and also strategies for addressing these important, uh, important issues. I will put a, um, uh, an advanced plug-in for uh, joining the mental health and TB working group of the union. Um, we'll circulate some sign-in sheets. We would appreciate you, if you're interested in these topics, to sign in, uh, sign up. Uh, we'll correspond with you. So, so really, we want to build a community of practitioners and advocates and uh, researchers um, interested in these issues, and uh, I would very much encourage you to, to sign up. It's one of the working groups of the union. So just very briefly, the issue of tuberculosis and mental disorders, you know, it, it crosses a lot of different, uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways to think about it, and has a lot of attributes of, of different areas of, of TB uh, control. On one hand, and we heard this morning uh, um, at, the, uh, at the plenary about the social protection a strategy, the social protection agenda and its intersection with TB. And very much mental disorders, populations who, um, um, who are afflicted with um, mental illnesses and substance use disorders are some of the most disadvantaged, uh, marginalized, stigmatized populations uh, in society. And there's a whole huge overlap and connection with, um, with issues of uh, social disadvantage, strategies for social protection, and the intersection with mental illness. That's one whole stream of work, and, and, uh, um, and we'll hear a little bit about that today. There's another way to think about it, another set of issues around, um, if you will, sort of the more um, medical um, or uh, uh, the traditional comorbidity uh, thinking about um, mental illness, uh, more akin perhaps to, say, diabetes and tuberculosis. Um, or other uh, non-communicable disease intersections with TB, where there may be some biologic mechanisms for increased risk, and we're going to hear about inflammatory markers and, and, um, and, and inflammatory processes that might be uh, connected with, between uh, mental illnesses and tuberculosis. And of course, there's interactions with the medications and how certain TB meds can precipitate mental, mental illness. So, so there's some sort of biologic as well as social dimensions to, these, uh, to this interaction that we'll be hearing about today. It makes for a very complex story, story about mental disorders as risk factors um, that uh, make uh, TB more likely, either from a biologic perspective or because of uh, being a vulnerable population. Comorbidities, complicating management, complicating uh, um, uh, completion of treatment, um, bad outcomes, et cetera. And then, of course, the implications for, for what to do about it are complex, ranging from screening um, to, to treatment. And to date, relatively little of these issues are addressed in formal national tuberculosis programs. And we're going to hear today about a survey that was done of NTP managers looking at to what degree these issues are even known about, thought about, protocolized, addressed in the context of TB programs. Um, and I'll, and uh, for anyone uh, in the audience who's part of a national TB program, we'd like to hear more about the experiences and the interests of national TB programs in dealing, uh, in developing protocols and approaches to these issues. Um, so we have, so there's a science challenge, there's a conceptual challenge of communicating these issues and highlighting these issues, 
and there's a what to do challenge. Um, and we're gonna, I think, hear about all of those issues um, today. So before we get into the, uh, the program, uh, perhaps I'd uh, ask uh, Knut to make a few comments as well. Right, so my name is Knut Klanroth, working in the Global TV program. I'm working on a lot of different aspects of risk factors, comorbidities, and determinants, and consequences of TB. Mental health is, is just one of them. Uh, thanks for inviting me to chair this. So Adam is talking about this, the complex story. And, and indeed, mental health, it can be a, a cause, it can be a consequence, it can be a comorbidity, it can be a conditionality for screening, or it can just be a co co coincidental companion, I put that together well, of TB. Uh, regardless, and I think you said it, Adam, the bottom line here is that we need to identify and address as part of TB care and prevention, and obviously that cannot be done by TB programs alone. It's an issue of collaboration with other sectors of the health sector, as well as operating with uh, partners outside in, in the social sector, for example. So I think uh, that is enough as an introduction. I will have a, a rich set of, of, of presentations and hopefully some time for discussions at the end. Uh, so let's start uh, with um, uh, Ernesto Jaramillo. You're giving the first presentation? Um, Ernesto is my colleague in WHO. He's dealing with a lot of things, more, more things on his agenda than mine, but his main topic is MDR-TB, but all these issues, mental health issues and all issues around risk factors and, and, and determinants are, play out in, in much more complex and often severe ways for MDR. So he has a, ri a rich experience in this field. Ernesto, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, 15 minutes, right? Uh, yes, we'll do 15 minutes, maybe one or two questions at the end of each, and then time at the end. But yes, yes. speakers, please uh, you know, keep to your time so we have enough time for, for conversation. Thank you. Then what I would like to do in the next uh, 15 minutes is just to give a kind of a policy perspective and a framework that will be actually a point of entry to address mental health disorders. But at the end of the day, uh, the need it goes well beyond the people who have mental disorders, because uh, the fundamental point of entry is the stress that people are passing through when they suffer the disease. I have plenty of interest behind this, but no one conflicting with the purpose mm -hmm. of the meeting. Uh, probably the main interest is around the way people are experiencing the tuberculosis, the disease, right? Uh, suffering is probably the hallmark of the way people experience tuberculosis and including multidrug resistant tuberculosis. Uh, the TB does not occur in isolation of the social context in which people live their lives, but pills, never mind how powerful they are, they are not going to solve all the other causes of suffering people are passing through. However, when we then look into the nature of suffering, there are some questions that come across. What is the nature of the suffering of people with TB? When do they suffer? Why is right to prevent and alleviate the suffering and how we can prevent that? And it's not limited to MDRT. MDRT is probably the most extreme uh, situation. There are five dimensions of that suffering, and one of them is the emotional suffering. For the physical, we have this nice, powerful, effective regimen, at least for drug-susceptible TB, less effective for MDRT, but there is something. And then for the social and for the spiritual and economic, then there might be the social protection for the economic, and there are still some things to do and work out for the emotional, social, and, and spiritual dimension of the suffering. When do they suffer? And they suffer across the full uh, history of, of the disease. The people suffer when there is no access to treatment. That sounds quite obvious, but the suffering may be worsened after treatment is like, uh, and uh, the suffering may be worsened once the disease is diagnosed, especially when they have to get exposed to nasty drugs, regimens that make their life miserable. On top of that comes the stigma and discrimination associated with the disease, come the loss of income because of the need to adhere to treatment. And once the treatment uh, finishes, if patient is declared cured, then you still have to suffer of the consequences of having passed through the labeling of being a TB person, right? Uh, or if treatment fails and treatment is not suspended, you are still suffering because being exposed to a health system that quite often is not having a patient-centered approach, but trying to ensure that the patient meets the expectations of the health system. And if all treatments are ex exhausted, then comes the suffering of knowing that you are unlikely to get cured, and then you still are alive with a lot of social responsibilities. 
then no wonder why systematic reviews uh, on quality of life in care in, in TB, which is a really under-researched area in tuberculosis, have shown that quality of life deteriorates significantly after the diagnosis of tuberculosis and throughout the course of treatment. Why is right then to address this kind of suffering? Well, there are uh, human rights, but also ethical reasons to address that is the core of the ethical duty to care to relieve the suffering of people uh, who are passing through different kind of illnesses. But there are also public health reasons for doing that, is that when the suffering is neglected, it's less likely that they can benefit for, from the treatment that services, health services are delivering. So uh, adherence is crucial, and the suffering then competes for prioritizing uh, adherence to treatment. The NTV strategy reflects that very well. First of all, in the goal of zero suffering. It's one of the three goals of the NTV strategy. And all that underpinned by four fundamental principles. One of them is the protection of human rights, the promotion of human rights, and ensuring that sound ethics and equity is behind everything that is done through the NTV strategy. And probably pillar one is the one in which most of these things are condensed around the idea of patient-centered care with prevention. Patient-centered care refers then to the notion of ensuring that the needs, the values, and the preference of the patients are at the center of the response, and not only the result of the smear test or the gene expert test. That means that a sound evaluation of the profile of the patient, of the specific needs of the patient, which have to include as well the capacity to respond to the stress, to the suffering, not only physical, but also emotional and social they are passing through, is as crucial as the result of the gene expert or the lab assessment of the disease. In order then to mount a better response to this, WHO has conducted a great assessment of the evidence that uh, is available on different options to uh, provide services through social support with a patient-centered approach. And the grade assessment is uh, about to be finalized. Uh, it will be part of the update of the drug-susceptible TB treatment guidelines coming early coming year. We look at different types of social support interventions, but I just want to highlight the two crucial elements relevant for a mental health dimension in the response to tuberculosis as part of routine care. Patient education showing very clearly that higher treatments of success, completion, cure, and adherence are observed in people who have been, uh, uh, who have access and who are receiving uh, education and information interventions. I want to emphasize the, the concept of social support that includes education and information and not only emotional and material support. Then the psychological dimension of the support. Emotional support, three, uh, four randomized control trials, two of them looking at treatment success and completion, one looking also at failure, are consistently showing that there, are, there is higher rate of treatment completion, lower rates of treatment failure and loss to follow up when there is psychological support. And here the criteria for enrolled patients on this kind of intervention was not having a severe mental disorder is referring to the, by default, mental health support that anyone who is passing through a challenging experience like having diagnosed with tuberculosis should be eligible, should have access to. So as important as the medicine, as important as having access to a new medicines, to shorter regimen, whatever, is also the access to these basic elements of care that should be a routine. Uh, when we combine all these interventions, education, information, material support, and compare that with the delivery just of DOT or the delivery of self-administration, consistently show higher rate of treatment success when social support is part of the package. In other words, the pills alone do not do the trick. Going back to the reality of the patient, can we really help them to look at our face just because they are able to feel supported, that they feel enabled to adhere to treatment and to carry on with the usual duties just because the care we are providing have this kind of more holistic perspective in which addressing the suffering coming from the stress, the 
uh, they are passing because of the diagnosis of the disease and because of the change of different roles in their lives. Having conducted this systematic review, then opened the doors to make of this not an option, but just a must as part of the routine operations of the program that have been focused for too long, almost exclusively in prioritizing, ensuring delivery of pills in the mouth of the patient, forgetting that all this happens in a context. Sometimes we may think, well, it's kind of obvious. Why to conduct a systematic review to assess what is obvious? Well, donors want to see value for money. And donors have said, well, why is the NTP and the TB program to be seen as responsible for doing things that other actors in the healthcare system are responsible for? Hence, we concentrate on something that is exclusively our responsibility. This systematic review is confirming that <laughs> the impact of those primary responsibilities for diagnosis of treatment is limited when those other elements of the care and the response are not, also, are not addressed. Higher treatment outcomes when you address the psychological dimension of the disease, when you address the response to treatment with promoting social support and with promoting this package of services. This is certainly a point of entry for addressing other needs of uh, in mental health that patients are in need of and that my colleagues, I think, would be discussing in more detail in the rest of the symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ernesto, and thanks for staying so very well in, in, in time. So that gives us quite a lot of time for, for um, some questions and comments at this point. Darcy, uh, do we have microphones in here, by the way? Uh, it's a small room. Speak up. Good. Diagnosis and, and also pre-diagnosis, when, when people are suffering because they're trying to find a diagnosis, and then in receiving the diagnosis, the fear that comes along with that. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, both points uh, well taken. The, that, that first, uh, regarding your first question, that was not addressed in the review precisely because of the limited evidence available, which reflects a major gap, right? Uh, However, we did include in the review, and it's not presented here in, in, in my set of slides, is the relevance of having staff properly educated and sensitized to the issue. So the I see what the mind knows. So if there is not a previous sensitivity, if we don't get the people aware about the issues that are coming behind the diagnosis, then there is less clarity and motivation to, to uh, address that and, and to cover that part. So regarding the... Uh, your, your second question, if you remind me again quickly. Just, just in terms of when people are Ah, yes, about, uh, yes, that absolutely is another crucial part, but there is even less evidence available about how the process is going on. And, and this is the opportunity of looking at the prevalence surveys as a source of information that help us to understand better about the critical path followed by patients when they are seeking health. Right? What we do know from the systematic review that we have conducted, uh, Kunud and other colleagues, uh, and Paul is a couple of years, showing how costly it is in economic terms. So the catastrophic expenditures, catastrophic costs associated with not only the case holding, but also the case finding. But when it comes to those dimensions, the evidence available is, is pretty limited. And it's an area that should be enriched in order to inform better policy advice to countries. One more question, then we'll move on. Uh, Chuck Norman, USAID, Bangladesh. Would the uh, package of psychological support also include the provision of psychopharmaceuticals? No, that was not included in, 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 the, in the intervention that, that were assessed. It was more limited to the baseline uh, patient uh, primary care for uh, emotional stress that uh, different interventions were providing. 
uh, that might be more relevant for uh, the discussion about how to address specific uh, conditions that are associated with TB in many settings, including depression and other mental disorders right. that so probably a, Annika is going yeah. to address in her presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks yeah. for that presentation. Um, yes, I think that's a good segue and, and sort of highlights this, um, you know, this, uh, it, as we said, the sort of complex understanding of, you know, the mental health axis well-being, psychological supports, um, uh, that sort of thing, and the mental illness axis, um, more clinical syndromes appropriate for psychotherapy or psychopharmacology, um, and important to distinguish these two things. And that was a very nice uh, start for the conversation, and uh, we'll also hear about some of these other more, uh, 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 more clinically oriented uh, uh, situations and approaches. So our next presenter is Annika Sweetland. Um, uh, Annika is Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at Columbia University in New York. She's been working on these issues of TB and um, uh, mental illness, specifically depression, uh, for 18 uh, years. She's a social worker, she's a researcher, um, and she's also co-chair of the TB and Mental Health Working Group uh, that I mentioned before, uh, and a real leader um, uh, in the thinking and the, and, uh, the global work on these issues. Um, so she's going to be talking about um, uh, survey and uh, impressions gained from national TV program managers. Thank you. Thank you, for everyone, for being here today, especially on the last day of the conference. We've managed to get the symposium in a couple times, but we're always the last session of the last day. We're the last page of everything, but we're here, so <laughs> that's great. Um, so I'm going to talk about, well, let me just give a, a background first, because every time I have an opportunity, I give the, my pitch about why this topic is important. It's important because we know that people with mental disorders and substance use disorders, they're less likely to come in for treatment right away. And, and because of these treatment delays, by the time they get there, they're oftentimes sicker, so their prognosis is affected by that. They're less likely to take all of their medications or go to all their appointments or even, you know, it, especially with depression, for example, even being motivated to take the treatment. And in that case, they're more likely to, with inconsistent therapy, direct, um, develop drug resistance, treatment, fail treatment, um, and or die. And then another piece that, um, to add to the equation, is, is from um, a transmission point of view, where all of this time that people are in the community not taking effective treatment or taking it inconsistently or developing drug resistance, they're also infectious in the community for longer periods of time, oftentimes with drug resistance strains. So there's a public health uh, significance to it as well. We also know that treating mental disorders and substance use disorders among, um, among TB patients can improve outcomes and can therefore curb the, the spread of TB and MDR-TB. We need more research in this area, but the, what we have so far suggests this, and we know this very, very clearly with almost every other comorbid illness with mental illness. So the TB and Mental Health Working Group we established three years ago, and there are, there are three objectives to the group. Um, first of all, we want to find out either what people are doing currently to manage mental health, mental disorders in, in the community. So identifying providers that are already addressing these problems and link them with researchers so we can develop an evidence base. We want to test what's working, what's not working. Or we, on the other side, we want to bring evidence-based practices from researchers to the field to adapt them to the context of TB and again, establish models that can be replicated. So once we have a stronger evidence base, and this includes pharma pharmacological interventions, uh, we really just don't have the research yet, and that's, that's um, primary on the agenda. And the last goal will be to disseminate to national TB programs globally. So this is what this, it's this last point that I'm going talk to talk to um, today because it's the idea that if, if we had these models, what's the receptivity in national TB programs to actually incorporate these types of um, integrated models? Um, and the findings were quite surprising. So the justification for this project was, and the research questions are, that there, there are several treatment models that exist. There, there's examples of non-specialist-led um, interventions in low-income settings where, there's, where community health workers or nurses or non-specialists are trained to deliver the care even without medications, just um, uh, behavioral activation, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, interpersonal psychotherapy. These are all recommended by the WHO. 
as evidence-based practices, and they've been done in low-income settings by non-specialists with, with lots of supervision. And so we need to, to take these models and apply them in, in uh, the context of TB and create models that can be replicated and adopted at um, national level. And in order to do that, we're going to need buy-in at, at a political level. So the three research questions of the study are, what are the perceived needs of global national TB programs with respect to mental and substance use disorders? What are the current practices and protocols? And is there access to treatment currently? And then finally, what is their receptivity to integrating, to having an integrated model of care at a, at a national level? So the methods were we conducted 30, sorry, 20, uh, 30 minute interviews with national TB directors from 20 countries. Um, we took advantage of the Cape Town meeting to do as many as possible in person, and the rest were by Skype and phone, and, or in writing. And we assessed the perceived needs and challenges, current practices, protocols, and access, and receptivity. And the study was approved by the Ethics uh, Committee of the Union, as well as the New York State Psychiatric Institute. So the data collection happened within the last year, um, from starting in Cape Town until, until uh, last, actually last month. And we, so we interviewed 20 people in 20 countries. All the interviews were in English, so this is a limitation I'll get to later. Um, and 16 of them, 80% of them, were classified as high incidence and or high burden countries with TB, TB, HIV, or MDR-TB. Um, we have four regions represented, which is um, a limitation that we were, we were if anyone, I, oh, sorry, to, um, to make a plug, if anyone's connected to any of the national TB program managers of any country that's not on this list, I'd appreciate um, trying to get in touch. We, we prioritize the top 50 countries as identified by the WHO as either, uh, so either the high, there's the top 30 that are high burden, but we also included the list of high incidence um, to, to target. So we have um, many African countries, some Europe and Central Asia, North Africa, Middle East, and the Americas. We do have good representation in terms of income level. So 10% or two of the countries were high income countries, six upper middle, six lower middle, and six low income countries. Um, the, in terms of high burden and high incidence, TB, HIV, MDR, TB, you can see we have a representation across the board of, of high burden, high incidence countries. And so now getting to the results, um, only two countries out of 20, 10% had actually any national guidelines for mental health services. Only one country had any sort of routine screening of any mental disorder, depression, anxiety, trauma, psychosis. Um, routine screening for substance abuse was, was somewhat higher, four countries out of 20, and the availability of community mental health treatment was around half as a substance abuse treatment as well, which seemed a lot higher than I was expecting. Reported. Reported, yeah. I mean, so, yes, yeah, these, these questions are all opinion questions of the national TB managers, so we didn't um, hold them to any statistics or anything, but just sort of their impressions of the situation. Um, the main comorbidities that were perceived to be a challenge were HIV, which was in 19 out of 20 countries, diabetes, heart disease, and hypertension in a few countries. Any mental disorder was uh, 12, alcohol and drugs as well. In fact, alcohol was 18 out of 20, perceived that to be a problem. The top barriers in each of the countries to treatment adherence were um, stopping medication when feeling better, so that's also linked to the uh, awareness and um, patient education piece that Ernesto was referring to. Um, pill burden, especially in the, in the um, high, high HIV burden countries. Poverty, side effects, substance abuse, medical comorbidities, distance, mobile populations, and system failures in general. The vulnerable subpopulations, sorry, you can't, you can't see it that well, um, were uh, HIV, which that was in, I think it was 19 out of 20, I recognize HIV as a, uh, HIV um, patients as a significant risk group, prison populations, migrants and refugees, children, 
homeless, minors, elderly, and other. The, the treatment settings, 95%, so almost all countries um, treat, um, treat TB in prisons, about half treat in psychiatric hospitals, is seven in refugee camps, and four in homeless shelters. And the homeless shelters, um, that piece was interesting because it's, when you have the so many low-income countries, they don't have homeless shelters, so it's not, not relevant. That's more relevant to the higher income countries. So this was the finding that was the most surprising to me, is that the receptivity was extremely high. So for 70 percent, almost, um, and well, 70 percent were extremely receptive, and 15 more percent were, were somewhat uh, receptive to integrating mental health treatment at a national level. So if these tools were available, if low-cost, effective treatments were available that could be done by non-specialists in low-income settings, there is a lot of buy-in at a political level um, to be able to incorporate these, these practices into treatment. And finally, the, the main barriers that they recognize as um, in terms of before we can get there are lack of capacity, lack of funding. 50% um, said that, that mental health disorders weren't recognized as a problem and to a smaller extent, social stigma. There were several limitations to this study, um, among which uh, some of which I've mentioned. But you know, these are these are opinion questions from the directors. They're not um, based on hard data specifically. Um, we had a very difficult time getting the contact information for national TB directors. We started with a list from the from the union, which was fairly incomplete and out of date. And then we got another list from uh, the Stop TB initiative, and prioritized the top 50. But language barrier was an issue for a couple of the interviews I wasn't able to do because I don't speak Chinese or Russian. And um, we tried to do them in writing. But um, so this was definitely a challenge. And we would like more representation. If there's a possibility of getting more countries, we'd like to include them. Um, and we weren't able to get uh, total regional representation, um, most of all in South Asia. So the conclusions are that there's a, there's a need perceived need, as well as an opportunity given the political buy-in to integrate treatment for mental and substance use disorders in TB programs globally. And in order to do this, we need to develop, um, we need to develop evidence-based practices. We need to provide guidance to national TB programs about how to screen for mental disorders, how to treat mental disorders, and how to do co-management of TB and mental disorders, and create indicators for standard TB program monitoring and reporting systems. Uh, these are some of my, so Cynthia Driver is the uh, co-principal investigator on the study. She's at Vital Strategies with Adam. Um, Rita Lodlo, who's here, uh, Adam, and um, some more colleagues at, at, um, at my school. And um, I'd like to thank the NTP directors that actually did participate, because it was a very valuable uh, exercise. I think just, just one question. Uh, we have time for a friend. I think uh, funny is next. Um, to be in mental health is like a coin. It's like a coin. A coin. So you are you're tapping into one side, where right? you're doing entity managers. What's your guess if you're starting to do mental health management for those countries, same countries? What way would be the rest of the same question? For the to ask the mental health integration, how the mental health managers, sorry, how they will answer. Would you mind to repeat in the back? Okay, <laughs> sorry. It's a, I, I assume that to be in a mental health is like a coin. We have the two sides. Mm -hmm. You are interviewing and to be managers, 20 answer. My question is, what's your guess in, uh, if we are starting to view in the health mental health managers for those same countries? For How TB. will it be for to be integration for <laughs> mental health? I think it would be extremely, extremely low. This is one thing that I've noticed that um, my, my expertise in psychiatry and TB, I, I sort of bridge the two fields, and I find on the mental health side, I get almost no openness to talking about these issues. But on the TB side, I get a lot of receptivity, which is partly why um, I'm pushing this angle. Um, I find the TB audience to be, you know, desperate for tools to improve outcomes, and 
so there's a lot of openness. And on the mental health side, it's virtually non-existent, <laughs> I suspect. That's a good, that's a, right, one more question and uh, a <laughs> very provocative question in front of you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Annika. I, I don't think this is a question. This is just a comment that in many low-income settings, in particular sub-Saharan African countries, we, we don't have uh, mental health programs. Or it could be one person sitting in, in a small office in the ministry. It's very different from BRICS countries and high-income countries. And since I wear the TBHIV hat, I was quite um, motivated to try to push um, inclusion of the NAP managers who do exist in a number of these countries and they're quite po powerful positions isn't it and our patients especially in my part of the world are often having TB perhaps even MDR TB or uh, recurrent TB and mental health issues and HIV infection uh, over and above everything thank you Okay, thanks. Thanks. Uh, uh, I guess, Rita, that the, the appropriate target group for next set of questions is the ministers of health. And the question is, do you think it's important to have uh, mental health services as part of the health system, maybe with some programmatic thinking? And because it's a real problem, I guess, when you want to establish linkage with something that is not a, a clear entity to start a dialogue with. Annika, thanks, thanks a lot. We move on. Um, the next speaker has already warmed up a bit. It's Afranio Kritsky. <laughs> he's a professor of medicine at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And he's also the director of the Reed uh, TB Research Network in, in Brazil. He has a rich research portfolio. And every time he speaks, he comes with some new interesting research. And today, it is about biomarkers for TB and depression. Afranio. Yes, thanks. Uh, uh, good afternoon for everybody. I Thanks a lot for the invitation, inviting me to present uh, the topic biomarks for TB in depression. Just to start in, I would uh, talk in less than 10 minutes, don't worry about them. Uh, I'm, through this, this, uh, this project, we start to, in Brazil, um, I thank Annika because she convinced me to embark on this arena, uh, to bring the translation science to start looking at uh, pillar one, Ernesto. <laughs> so that's the way we can try to tackle how we can bring the three pillars work together, not only to d provide drugs or tech new, new pr pr products. And in, in Brazil, we, we, we were able to do that, to tackle TB and depression. We need funds for that. And then the only way to get funds in Brazil was through a translation science. That's the reason we we start with biomarkers. So as has been said, uh, you know that quite well, mental disorders are associated with the worst medical conditions, high rate of uh, no adherence, uh, lower quality of medical care, and also associated with premature death. You know that quite well. But more recently, in the last 10 years, that we say 12 years, Depression, immune infection uh, is a central path pathways to morbidity mortality. We know that uh, among depressed patients, we have a high rate levels of interferon gamma, IDO, TNF, and IOT6. IOT These in increase the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal activity and cortisol levels, and then promote a huge challenges, huge disorders in immunological response, immune response. And more recently, the, the among depression, mental health arena, there are this huge discussion about the role of tryptophan, kynurenine, it's tough for me to say that word, pathway in the mental disorders. Why kynurenine is a, promotes immune response and releases neurotoxic compounds, very huge. You see the tryptophan pathway You see the uh, tryptophan, if we, when we have wet idol, we, we increase a lot to the kyrenine levels. That's the, the topic I would like to, to address. Now, coming back to TB mental disorders, we, again, is recent. I'm working TB since the 80s. I, I was talking to Annika. I became very surprised when uh, I realized that uh, TB depression is a quite huge uh, 
proportion of uh, TB patients, they have uh, mental disorders. You see we have a lot of uh, some studies uh, released recently. Most of the studies, they use triage approach. I will talk to you about that a little bit. Perhaps it's a little bit uh, higher than, than the real pr proportion, but it still is real. It's a high level of prevalence of depression among TB patients. And more recently, you see the people from uh, Stefan Kaufman working in biomarkers, looking at inflammation, immunosuppression, uh, through my metabolomic profile among TB patients, they realized that uh, uh, chironinin levels was quite higher comparing to the TST positive, TST negative asymptomatic subjects. So highlighting that, that this, this type of uh, uh, substance is quite higher among TB patients. But there is no evaluation to the role of chironinin patients with TB and depression. That's we we submit the proposal, we got a small funds to start point to see what's going on in Brazil, as I said. So I, I thank you, uh, my colleagues from Columbia University, Anika and Mario Kendo, and also Brazilian colleagues. And I'll just show you very preliminary data which just started last year. First is clinical data. We use uh, three instruments, Minimento, is just to evaluate the cognitive deficit. Uh, PHQ-9 is a triage, three screening for depression, and the mini plus is uh, to diagnose depression. You can see uh, among 68 uh, to be patients, um, uh, the depression was higher through two instruments among those who had deficit, cognitive deficit. Uh, it's, it's quite higher, you see, 35, 50, 61, 90, but in a total, among 68 TB patients, as I said, the preliminary data, uh, the final diagnosis was 32%. So it's, it's quite high. Yeah, it's higher than expected. Now I'm showing you very preliminary uh, data on in in for in vitro studies, looking at a chironirin pathway. So the idea is to, to evaluate the role of BCG and H37RV infection in the uh, THP1 cells and human macrophages, and also the impact of the IDO inhibitors, uh, like min minocycline is an old antibiotic that's used by leprosy and mental disorders, and also no harmine is an IDO inhibitor. You can see here, it says, uh, when in fact with BCG THP1 macrophage, we, there's a 24 hours after a huge increase of uh, chironine, and that decrease after we add minocycline and also no hermine, it's A and OJ. When you analyze the cytokines, again, among THP1 cells infected by with BCG, we see the same. You see a huge uh, uh, increase of TNF, IO1 beta, CCL4, and CCL3, and all those three. Uh, markers were decreased when we add minocycline or norhamine. It's very interesting data. When you look at a um, human macrophage infected by BCG, the same. So we increase with BCG increase kynurenine level and decrease after we add uh, minocycline, 24 hours after. And now we're using infected not only by BCG but uh, by with H37 RV. The same happened, you see increase the level of chironine and decrease when we add uh, IDO inhibitor, uh, minus, minus uh, Look at expression of I chironine, IDO, and other compounds. You can see when in fact with uh, human uh, TPH1 macrophage with H37 RV is a huge increase, you see. And then we add the minocycline is a huge decrease again. So it's very interesting there. So we just to confirm the data. And finally, that, uh, that last, least recently te we tested the neurons of the dorsal root ganglia for newborn mice. You see here, we're using a neuro, evaluated neurofilaments marker. So the idea is to, to see development of axon neurons using culture by immunohistochemistry, you see F when we add chironinin, blocked all the process. It's very interesting. Now the next step is to see what's happened to the animal model, so if you can confirm the in vitro study results. 
So the comments is uh, we found a high proportion of a major depression among TB patients. Uh, we also found a high kynurinine release after BCG in H37V infection in HP1 cells and also in human macrophages. We found a decreased kynurinine after minocycline and norhymen use those two IDO inhibitors. And also surprisingly, not surprised, but it's, uh, we found a neurofilaments activity decrease quite a lot after we include uh, or, uh, the kynurimine in the experiment. The final remarks is it seems that the increased release of kynurimine after BCG in H37 IV infection observed through in vitro studies may suggest that kynurimine metabolism play an important role in developing depression in humans. We have to test that to confirm those data. Currently, we are collecting clinical data and samples from TB with and without depression, and also non-TB case with and without depression, pursuing the evaluation of kynurinine role, and also identify additional biomarkers associated with depression among TB patients. And I thank my colleagues in Brazil, uh, in Rio, and also Phil Cruz, and also in uh, Columbia University. I think it's okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Afrenio. Uh, so quite complex thinking in the field of uh, immunological and neurological pathways here. Uh, any questions from, from the audience? One or two? I'll ask one if no one else will. Um, it was indeed complex, but I think um, the focus here was on uh, susceptibility to depression in patients infected with tuberculosis or you know, uh, in the presence of tuberculosis. Can you comment on the other directionality of, uh, of uh, TB risk among depressed patients? Is, this, is it the same immunological pathways or a whole different? Uh... We don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's it. So the data which I've just shown is, is a cross section, a very small sample. We just start tackling to see what type of biomarkers. We don't have results to show to you yeah. using clinical sample for humans. But, uh, and also I didn't show the difference between, we, it would be nice to know the difference between to be patient with a new depressed right. status and a, with the old ones, right. just the first, yeah. you, 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 yeah, even with a cross-section. No? Yeah. But the project is, is to follow up yeah. the, the families and also the patients. What's the role, I mean, not only to the clinical outcome, but also what's happening for, uh, regarding biomarkers at the beginning two months and six months after. That's what we are evaluating now, I think, in some way. We don't have a, yeah. a clue yet. Yeah. A new arena, in fact. Yes. And maybe one more question, yeah. Yeah, is kynurinine yeah, it's a biomarker or whatever, a transmitter of depression in non-TB patients? Is it, is it a known agent in depression in general? That's a good question, yeah. It is it's indeed, is a, is a a biomarker for inflammation, you can say, is an inflammation response. And I, I just uh, present those preliminary days in Durban in a report uh, uh, meeting in July. So we have a, to tackle with the co-founders co co like HIV, for example, and other comorbidities that can be play a role to increase the kynurinin uh, also. But um, the data we have, we had in vitro studies, is quite sure that it plays a big role uh, the kynurinine with the empty uh, mycobacterial infection is quite related. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, would like to see what's the role in MTB among humans. Yeah. Okay, one very, very quick, very, very quick. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, the, your, you know, your question can be answered only for long, uh, longitudinal studies. Then we can follow up the close contacts who acquire TB disease, depressed or non-depressed, and ask what happened to those patients with TB disease, use anti-TB treatment, follow FQ, what proportion of them were, uh, re uh, have a relapse among those with depression and without. So it's a big, big court studies. You're, you're right, but we have no data published yet on that stuff. Okay, thank you very much. A very stimulating uh, uh, presentation on uh, filling in the biological story here.
So our next presentation is uh, from uh, a colleague from uh, Bangladesh, Dr. Um, uh, Akram Islam, um, who is the director of uh, BRAX uh, TB and Malaria uh, Control uh, Program, um, and uh, also the um, uh, Water Sanitation Hygiene Programs at BRAC. He's been there since 1993. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor at the James P. Grant School of Public Health at Brack University. He's a longtime collaborator and colleague at the Union um, and a real prolific uh, writer and thinker on tuberculosis, on tobacco control, and many other topics. So thank you very much for being here um, and sharing your experience uh, with us. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah. So. Let me say a few words in, uh, about Bangladesh TV program then quickly, and then I will move my main uh, topics. Uh, as you know, the one of the high volume countries in Southeast Asia and having more than 300,000 incidents. Um, so in Brax has been working since 1984 with the national program and, and almost supporting national programs for two thirds of the part of the country. So it's quite a large number of uh, uh, people we treat every year. So that's one of the uh, area that's been contributing uh, in the national programs, and uh, with uh, success rate, treatment success rate over about 90 percent. So that's basic scenario of the TB program that we have it. Um, while looking at this uh, progress, we made it. Uh, we we try to identify uh, what really. Uh, uh, main barriers for accessing care at earlier stages so that we could have better interventions. And then uh, we try to look into this um, uh, sufferings, more focusing on stigmas and psychological problems and emotional settings, uh, and also this uh, how it affects in, in, in care-seeking behavior uh, at earlier stages as well as in treatment adherence. So that's what basics uh, we we thought maybe we should go through more and detail on the review of what really we have it. Uh, for doing that, um, we initially uh, did a kind of in-depth uh, interview about 100 patients with around 50 women and 50 men patients. Uh, and uh, we try to understand the, uh, the, the emotional, psychological uh, stress status with more focus on uh, stigmas. And while looking at that, uh, we also try to think that it, any other studies happened in, uh, conducted in Bangladesh that looks also the psychological status of the patients in the, the country. So we also find one study done in the one hospitals. So I'm not going on uh, mass on talk on that because that's kind of a, a more a kind of psychiatric treatment site. So I'm going more focused on the, what really makes the barriers for the peoples to come to sectors in the, in, the, in the care. So for doing that, uh, in the hospital settings, that's the physicians that being conducted study, we said almost 30% patients having a psychological problem, they have been found it out. And, and major illness is, is, is mostly, if you see this next slide, is depression and anxiety is around 70%, uh, rather than 30% of that psychiatric illness. So that's another big area uh, we find it out with this studies that are being done in one outpatient department hospitals. Uh, looking into this and then we uh, also try to understand what they basically they find it what are the basic factors uh, of those status this one issue is the drug financial issues social and familial issues and length of the treatment sphere of disclosure which is very similar to the other speakers saying it in uh, what the factors on psychological issues on the peoples uh, seeking care and also getting more uh, access to care um, when you look into this uh, more detail about the 100 patients that we have been following very in-depthly, and we found this um, stigmas and, and barriers are heavily on the women than the men in, in the country of Bangladesh. Uh, and that's really striking us, uh, even though in, in, in Brock's uh, um, tuberculosis control program, we are using almost women health workers throughout the country, about 100 health workers. 100,000 health workers throughout the country, but it still this exists in the society. So that's really you know, striking for us. And um, we thought we should do something for that because unless we could address this situation, we may not be able to act, enhance access to the women, particularly in the, in the, in the care and uh, services. So this it's really a shocking uh, finding, so we made a study. 
uh, and the men doesn't have much of that influence. It's men mostly on this related to the economic issues on their writing. So with these um, uh, findings, I would like to share with you a few of these uh, patients, what they really feel themselves. Uh, I try to say a few slides on their sticks, how they feel about the stress, stigmas, and, and uh, discomfort they feel. Um, one of the big areas that patients feel is the rejection, isolation, and social mixing, and particularly for the women. And one of the example of the one of the women about 30 years old explained that my husband is scared of me, and he doesn't appreciate me as before. In fact, my pride, dignity, and honor have uh, decreased to a large extent because of the diseases. So you can see the, exactly the, what really women are suffering there. So that's not one of the lens. Uh, preventing women to come forward even to the sales sectors, even we have a female health workers. So this is uh, one of the big area, uh, which is not the case of the men in, 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 in this kind of scare-seeking behavior. If you look into the, another area of uh, when we discussed about an 18-year-old girl said, I did not go to the anywhere, how they have been confined to the treatments, you know. I didn't go to anywhere, rather stayed at my room. I kept myself isolated from others because of the diseases. I was worried of the people's insult. So if you see statements or the ease of the statements, so uh, disappointing us uh, to knowing this, how this has been preventing them to come to the forward to the disease treatment cares and services and supports. Uh, well, I said it, um, males also sometimes, some of the issues they have been highlighted. One uh, man also said that one of my friends uh, one, uh, one wanted to know what happened to me and in a pray, I told him about my TV and Stanley started to move away from me. So in that case also, some men also feel some of the embarrassment in the society when they have the diseases. And from that day, I never, uh, he never met me and I got hurt by his unusual conduct. So he's, he's expressing the disease, as you say, it is really a difficult situation. The people doesn't like to come out that I have a disease itself. So if you see the TB society in, the, in the, any country, you don't find even patients group. Uh, if you try to, it's, it's very uh, unusual situation where you can, can find many countries that are patient groups. But in case of TB, you don't find a patient groups. And this really is, is, is striking us. Uh, how should we move forward further? Um, another example I'm given how this being tortured happens within the society is a 20-year-old uh, woman uh, with nine years of education said, whenever my nephews come close to me, my mother-in-laws takes them away. Uh, she will always keep me uh, no, on saying that. She was uh, saying that she will arrange another marriage for my husband. My husband also labels TB as a big disease, and he often asks me to commit suicide with poisons. At this, I get shocked and ask him to buy the poison for me, thus I am really in a state of mental torture. So you can see this distress and disorders at which level. And I will show one of the cases of uh, case study at my end of the presentation, how he really affects the life of the peoples at what degree it can be an extremely. So this is one of the examples that I'm saying is people have been suffering quite a lot, but are, these stories are really untold and we're not hearing from many people. And maybe time has come to you to understand these stories and then maybe redesign our own education programs or the design our front and work, workers uh, to be ready to address those in the society at, at large, not only on the programmatic condition, but also in the, in, the, the, in the community settings who really care the patients. Disclosure is another issue that uh, people doesn't like to disclose it. Uh, one of the um, women also said, I want to know, I, uh, I want that nobody should know about my diseases. Uh, if other people come to know, then I will be dis uh, disassociated from the society. Society will not accept me. Moreover, there will be a problem for my brothers and sisters' marriage, even the marriage can be broken. So if you see these uh, disclosures, so it's entire social stigma, taboos, pressures, is really affects entire psychological, emotional, and mental condition of the patients. The patients have been passing through over the six months or a year, and maybe sometimes through the life 
we, are, we don't have those kind of scenarios results and um, yeah is may as i say as i said is the most uh, men basically is concerned about the income rather than the women and and one of the uh, 35 years old male patient said this i became very weak to work because of the diseases that why i decided to stay away from the work until cure i also not to go outside to home so much and do not participate in social activities so that's also have an impact on entire financial Uh, part of the patients, so there's also income issues, uh, and the liabilities also affect by the even for the males they have been perceived. So this is few slides explains how this is um, the scenario of distress, stigmas, making the pressure of the mental uh, health, and then finally, one of the slides I would like to. So this may be a, it's not a usual case, very unusual, but in an extreme case. Uh, very recently, one of uh, the MDR patients uh, being diagnosed in 2016, and he was being given uh, community-based care by the village doctors. Uh, we didn't know that he was suffering quite a heavily mental uh, pressure or disorders, and then he, the patient uh, did not cooperate with the first uh, providers, and then we changed the provider to the next one. And on the sudden, uh, on the, in the sudden morning the, the patient told to the providers uh, you prepare your injections i came and then uh, and then he closed the door and he hit the providers and the providers are so in, injured very severely and then being hospitalized is still a very critical condition but particularly with his kidney sufferings is a quite a bad bad damage of kidney yeah so you can see this is the extent of the mental disorders can go what extent in, in, in a, even in the provider's case so i think this is my few slides uh, to share our experience from there and um, of course uh, what i was taking that say we need to be time as a come to basically integrate those ideas and informations in the routine programs what really programs can do it uh, and particularly the educations with the frontline workers and also perhaps the mental health issues need to be integrated to the tv services at least to identify what are the conditions on the patients what the, what is the status of their mental conditions then we can have a better care for that so thank you very much this may be last slide yeah so so if time for one or two questions yes <coughs> That was quite shocking, Akram, actually. Uh, upsetting. Um, are you doing anything or any of your Shasta Shubikas involved in any um, psychological intervention or other health workers? Anything you got planned for tackling depression in TB patients? Yeah, after uh, this study, uh, when we done in, in uh, two three years back, and then we basically started to uh, have a frame the education to the Shastra Shibikas to make a more and more so psychological supports to the to the patients. Uh, that's uh, it was not much talked before, but uh, when we know this is happening and it is really very strained in the problems, so then we incorporate some of the messages with our frontline workers. That's we done, but we haven't done anything on the MDR patients yet. So, but we did for drug sensitive cases, some education frames. Deliver it back. Thank you. I I uh, share John's uh, shock, isn't it? It it it's really very striking. Uh, I wanted to find out whether this stigma associated with TB is reversible in view of the fact that TB can be cured and you can completely recover from it. I, I do appreciate that your sample was TB patients, but perhaps you know something uh, about it from some other sources. Yeah, that's, that's the basically one of the education uh, is giving this uh, scurable, and, but it's still, you know, the, the people feel shy. They don't want to disclose it, and I don't know exactly the, what the reason. Perhaps they see this disease of the poor, disease of the... Uh, persons who is neglected in the society, so they perceived uh, the disease as is, is a disease of neglected persons. So that's maybe need to come forward 
maybe more and more and discuss more and more on that. And even if you find in a case of, uh, in any CCM, country coordination mechanism, there's people living with disease, you will hardly find a person that the disease represent in the CCM the right prevention. So I think this is really an issue of, and it takes maybe a long time to go on that. All right, thank you very much. Our last presenter today is uh, Jerome Galea. Um, he is deputy, uh, deputy director at uh, Socios and Salud at, in Peru, Partners in Health Peru, um, and a research fellow in global mental health at Harvard Medical School. His uh, interests, his research interests include community-based mental health service delivery models um, and uh, in addressing barriers, uh, barriers to care and, and, and care uptake. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a, it'll be a very nice uh, end uh, to our uh, session today uh, to hear about the experience in Peru. Um, uh, and thank you for being here. Great. Thanks for having me. And um, good afternoon. It's nice to be with the last speaker in the last session on the last day. Um, I also want to um, say, I said this in the, the, the mental health working group a few days ago, that um, I'm here today because I was inspired by coming to the symposium a year ago and hearing Annika speak. And so um, definitely do sign up for the working group. I think that um, strength in numbers. Um, so I'd like to tell you about what's happening in Peru. Um, it was really great to see the previous speakers because um, I hope to be able to show you in some small way at least that we're starting to put together some of the pieces of the puzzle. Um, when talking about when I think about mental health in, in TB, uh, for, first I think about mental health, and I think about just the overall prevalence of mental health disorders. Um, and in Peru, where I uh, work, the background prevalence of mental health in all adults is around 20% already. And so um, when you take a look at depression rates, for example, among primary care attendees in Peru, you can see that it... You know, it goes off the charts. It's not just TB. There's the background overall prevalence of 20%. Um, it skyrockets to almost 70% in women with HIV and AIDS. And then you ha there you have MR MDR TB. And so this is not a problem unique um, to TB by any means. This is what we're going to focus on. But I think it's useful to have kind of a broader perspective of um, the situation. Why Peru? Because um, we. Uh, rank again as a high burden country, specifically for um, MDR TB. We have around 31 new thousand cases of all types of TB each year, and around 6% of them um, are, are MDR TB cases. And in the part of town where Socios and Salud um, is located and where we do our work, um, it's, it's closer to 10%. So it's a very concentrated hotspot MDR TB area, and it's an area we've been working in for about 20 years. Um, and that's what I'll be focusing on today. Now, I'm sorry, Annika, in your study, you didn't get to talk to our director. Um, we'll make sure that happens. Uh, Carmen Contreras, the clinical director here, is a friend of the, the TV director. But this is taken uh, right out of the page of the, the guidelines. What this says, um, the TB guidelines, and in Peru, it says that all patients should have a screening a screening form applied to uh, rule out problems of depression, violence, alcohol c consumption, and other drugs, and then be referred to a health establishment. So that's great. It's in writing, it appears. Um, the issue is, is that until recently, the, the mental, mental health care was only delivered in three hospitals for the whole country in, in Lima. And so you could get referred to a primary care center, but um, there certainly would not be a psychiatrist. The general um, practitioner until recently couldn't prescribe from, uh, drugs for, say, depression, even if she or he wanted to, and the psychologist may or may not be there. And so there's an intention, and it's there, and it's definitely a first step, but it doesn't necessarily lead to treatment. And so a little bit uh, more about the context of Caraballo. As I said, it's, it's, um, it's in Lima, Peru. It's in, the, it's in what they call a northern cone. It's... Um, the, characterized by high concentration of migrants from the from the mountains and from the jungle, around 300, 240,000 people, a quarter in uh, living in poverty, more than that. 
Um, and around almost 40% lack basic services. So it's a perfect place for TB um, and lots of other diseases. Um, so going back to then uh, comorbidities, psychiatric comorbidities, the, the primary topic here, amongst patients undergoing MDR-TB in Peru, um, these are old data, but they are the data that exist. Um, but, um, and you've seen this discussed by other presenters, that depression kind of is the, num the, the, the number one comorbidity, anxiety, personality disorders, psychosis, and then there are some less common disorders. Some of these disorders exist already before a person has TB. Maybe some of these disorders activate TB. I think that's what uh, was discussed earlier. Um, some of these disorders get worse when you have TB, and some of the drugs used to treat TB cause some of these disorders. So it's, it's complicated and messy, and yet that's what we have, um, and we still have to deal with it. Um, about 20 years ago, and this was uh, one of the speakers, the first speaker said this, and um, I was glad because this is exactly the slide I have. 20 years ago, this is, this is our 20th anniversary, Socios and Salud um, knew from the beginning uh, that TB is, is not just treated with pills. It's, it's much more complicated than that. It's a huge part getting pills into mouths, but it's more than that. And it's definitely, we're all about partners in health and Socios and Salud from the very beginning adopted a patient-centered model. Um, with community health workers um, and linking and strengthening the um, the, health, the existing self, health system. So there's the clinical care, but there's the psycho-emotional and the socio-emotional uh, support. And so that includes things like infection control, making sure people have a place to live or they're not going to affect the rest of their family while they're undergoing treatment, nutritional supports, and of course, mental health. And I, this picture, um, I think, is probably almost around 20 years old. Um, this is a, social, a psychosocial support group that was started about 20 years ago, one that Annika um, helped uh, create and run and has published both a manual and a paper about, and those groups continue to today as a mental health activity. But really, um, it's more than that, and um, if you really want to address the problems of mental health, it has to be more than an activity. It has to really be a program. And so, um, there's a, about a year ago also, there was a, a, a program, a, a global program called Zero uh, TB Cities. If you, if you don't know about it, I encourage you to check it out. You can also check out one of our posters in row 28 um, if it's still up. But the purpose of um, TB Zero is not to duplicate existing services, but to strengthen the services to reduce the number of um, infections and uh, deaths and uh, default treatment defaults to zero in cities. And so cities around the world have started to adopt the TB zero guidelines. I'm going to be presenting some data um, on mental health in this, but what I want to point out in the TB, uh, the zero TB, the, we call it TB zero in Spanish, the zero TB project includes as one of the pillars mental health screening evaluation and psycho support, psychosocial support needs. And so um, when I, I put this slide in and I'll explain it um, just briefly, but uh, as I said before, if there isn't an existing mental health system in which you can refer to, it's hard to do much um, with the system and e because TB systems in themselves struggle to deliver adequate TB. Getting the pills in the mouth is a struggle to begin with. I feel very fortunate to be working in Peru. We are a country that has adopted the WHO MH GAP program, for those of you that are familiar with it. But it's all about transitioning services. Um, I mentioned that they were, a couple of years ago, delivered at three hospitals. Now they're being transitioned to the primary care level. And so um, let me see. I can't really show it. But the, where it says Centros SM Comunitarios, um, each, uh, the intent of the country, and in Caraballo where we work, They've now established um, tiny community mental health centers. And the structures around them that say CS are the primary care centers. And so now in Caraballo, when um, mental health, uh, with a person with a mental health disorder is detected, um, in theory, but it's beginning to happen at the primary care center, they can be referred to a community mental health center. And if it's acute, they get referred to the hospital. We now have mental health beds in general hospitals, something we didn't have even a year ago. And um, there are other support structures like protected homes, 
halfway houses and so forth. And so when you have a structure like this, a mental health structure, then, when you're, then it's much easier to work with the TB program. And so back to TB0. In the TB0 um, program in which Socios is, uh, is working on and in which even the mayor of Caraballo has signed on to and committed funds to, we do all kinds of assessments for overall uh, well-being, demographic information, and so forth, including depression. And depression is one um, I particularly want to focus on. Um, we are screening all patients. Um, so these patients aren't patients that we're capturing. These are patients that we meet at the health centers. We ask them if they'd like extra support to be part of the, the TB0 program. And we apply the, pa the patient health questionnaire, the PHQ-9. Um, we've actually programmed it into cell phones. Um, all the data we collect in all of our studies and projects for monitoring evaluation is, is done with mobile phones. And if you're not familiar with the scale, um, it's a good screening tool. It has um, five different categories. And when you get the score, you, it's just kind of not enough just to have a score. You, you actually have to have a depression care pathway. So what I learned, um, actually I was talking about the PHQ-9, I think, with you, Annika, also about eight or nine months ago, and I realized, well, it's more than just applying a form. You have to have a pathway, but if you have a pathway, you need a mental health team. So a parallel process about all of this in another talk is how we formed an actual mental health program at Socios and Salute. But this is just one part of it. And so what happens is that we get referrals from projects like TB0. They're screened with, um, with the PHQ-9 and other instruments. If they have a high score, then we accompany, accompany them to the mental health center or the hospital if it's severe. If it's less so, then um, we provide psychosocial support in community and we follow up regularly. So taking a look at the screening scores for uh, TB0, um, PHQ baseline, um, these are just, so we've just really gotten off the ground in the past three or four months. So I only have baseline data here, but you can see amongst the sensitive cases, 116 that we screened, about 15% of them had a PHQ-9 score that required accompaniment um, to the health center um, or to the community mental health center for care and follow-up. Whereas for the MDR, XDR cases, 13, so about 10% of the overall cohort, about 31% of them required more than just in-community psychosocial support. And when I say accompaniment, it's more than just kind of giving a number and saying, okay, off you go. I mean, it literally means accompanying that person physically to the health center and following up with them um, so that they can receive adequate care. Amongst those MDR, XDR cases, um, I want to mention it's, it is more than just depression. Um, there were cases of psychosis. All of these are being treated by psychiatrists now in Caraballo for this, these people. Domestic violence, uh, we also include as a mental health issue, drug use, and alcohol use. So um, so these are first steps for us. What, what I keep realizing is that it's like um, mental health um, delivery for me is kind of like peeling an onion. It's just several layers every single time. I get one layer off, I realize it's another layer, and sometimes it makes me cry. Um, but we've, um, so we're really trying to move beyond an activity to an integrated program. All of this has to be done in close collaboration um, with the, uh, not just the Ministry of Health, of course, but not just the TB program, but also the mental health program. I think we're very fortunate in, uh, in the place where we work because um, many of the people in the mental health program in Peru have been involved on the TB side since the very beginning um, of our work there 20 years ago. So I, I, I have a sense that we have a closer collaboration, at least in our district. Um, our focus is on exist really not duplicating services, but strengthening what exists. And when it absolutely does not exist, then we kind of show what it could be, and we help the, the Ministry of Health um, hopefully adopt that. But it really does require staff training and supervision. I, I can't emphasize that enough. We work with community health, um, com community health workers. They are supervised uh, in, the mental, in the case of mental health by psychologists on our team. Um, and they are supervised by uh, a psychiatrist um, when we have one on our team. Um, so a few, this is my last slide, a few challenges in the way forward. Um, so a big challenge, I think, and this is something that um, we've uh, not even just alluded to, spoken frankly about here, is I think that 
mental health care is probably not widely delivered at the primary care level in many of the, these high burden countries. Um, at least in Peru, we have the luxury, again, of having a law that makes community-based mental health care mandatory, a right. And um, we're working on delivering it. We're, the, the Ministry of Health is working on, uh, last year they had uh, no mental health services at primary care centers, this year up to 300, and they're scaling up to 7,000. So it's happening. Lack of specialized care is a problem. Um, so that means task sharing to uh, physicians so that they can prescribe medicines. But also, um, uh, it also means that NGOs like Socios and Salute can really start to deliver these evidence-based low-intensity interventions. I'm, I'm all with you. Um, we, it, to do that, you need a mental health program. And so we've been spending this year in developing our mental health program, and we plan on rolling out um, these low-intensity um, interventions, of which there are many that work um, in the next year. And finally, um, this is a theme throughout this conference. Um, all seven times I've been here, and, um, and it's that stigma hampers to care um, diagnosis treatment. And I hope to be part of the solution to this along with socios. Uh, I think it's time also um, to stop describing the problem and to start uh, doing interventions specifically around stigma that go beyond education, um, especially of, of, of staff that turn over a lot, and really work on um, interventions that change social norms. This is our mental health team um, that has done uh, most of the work. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of the TV Zero team, Carmen, but there are lots of people, of course, that are involved in this work, and I thank them. Thank you as well. Thank you very much for that presentation. Some uh, questions, comments? <laughs> Do we have the microphone? The most, uh, enticing thing. The, the end words were the most enticing. Low intensity mental health yes. intervention. What? So there's, there's, I mean, literally a compendium. When, first of all, when we say low intensity interventions, we generally are speaking about interventions that can be delivered by lay people or psychologists rather than psychiatrists. Um, where people, uh, first of all, there are the, the, the models of care that are heavily reliant on psych psychiatrists um, wouldn't work. They don't actually work even in countries like the US where there are lots of psychiatrists for the most part. But in, in Peru, we have 700 psych psychiatrists. Of those, 200 work in the public health system. And we are, we're a country of 30 million people. So by low intensity, I mean um, interventions that can be deployed by NGOs of psycho psych 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 psychologists or even, in, for the most part, even um, community health workers, promotores, we call them in Peru, um, that are trained. They can be three, five, or 10 sessions. They can be group. They can be individual. They can be cognitive behavioral. They can be one-on-one -on -one therapy. There's lots of different models, and they work. They're, they are oftentimes um, as good as some of the pharma pharmacological interventions. Now, I'm, I'm not speaking specifically for TB right now, but they're sometimes as good as even some of the pharmacological interventions for things like depression. So, and they're very inexpensive. And in places like Peru, where we have lots of community health workers, we have this existing network of people that, sh that in while they're doing DOTS, they're also seeing the mental health issues at the same time. They could be trained in these low-intensity interventions. So that's, that's kind of the uh, idea about it. I, I encourage you to check out the work by um, one of the leaders in this. His name is Vikram Patel um, from India. He has a TED Talk. Uh, if you just Google him, you'll see. And he, that's his big thing. And, and uh, also refer you to the WHO Mental Health Global Action Plan. It's, right. It, it, you know, this, this is one of the cornerstones of uh, you know, global mental health uh, development. And the, the fact is that specialized mental health services often don't exist, as was mentioned. This is an incredible development in Peru that it's actually being built. But in most low-income countries, there is no specialty mental health care at all. And task shifting or developing uh, community health worker-led evidence-based strategies, as Annika right. just said and you just said, is the way forward. And there are evidence-based models. They just haven't been yet into, they're not widespread and mostly not integrated, certainly in a TV program. Or culturally adapted yeah. in some cases, yeah. 
Yes. Can you pass yes. The mic? Can you pass the mic? Yes. <coughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Rebecca Lin, and I'm a pulmonologist from Taiwan, so I probably represent the missing piece in Anika's uh, global map. And I'm, a, uh, I'm in charge of one of the five MDR-TB programs in Taiwan. So my hospital, my hospital is actually a general hospital, but it's also a designated hospital for MDR-TB patients. So in Taiwan, we do have mental health system. However, if a patient is diagnosed having pulmonary TB while he is in the mental hospital, he will be immediately transferred to a TB hospital. So we're kind of like those last line, especially we're MDR-TB hospital. So, uh, but I'm lucky because one of my psychiatrists, he is willing, he's brave enough to walk into the negative pressure room to talk to my patients. So we're blessed by that. And I just want to share one of my examples because one of my patients, he was really hostile to all of us. And we are very desperate in how to communicate with him to talk him into receiving the MDR-TB treatment. And after he talked to my psychiatrist colleague, I realized that he is actually, every time the patient tells me to shut up is not talking to me. He's talking to the auditory hallucination inside his brain. But I wouldn't recognize he has, he suffered from this chronic schizophrenia for so many years. So uh, we are greatly helped by our psychiatrist. So I just want to point out that uh, I want to echo Ernesto's previous talk that uh, having this social support is really important to, in terms of treatment outcome, because it's just not uh, help the patient, but also help the healthcare worker as well. Because be it short-term regimen or long-term regimen, patients come and go, but we are st we'll be here forever for the patients, and we really need support. So I think it's uh, this kind of uh, benefit is actually mutual. I just want to point that out. Thank you. Um, just a couple quick comments. Maybe move away from that. A <laughs> couple quick comments. Um, Two things that, that didn't come up um, in Ernesto's talk, for, for example, we're talking about MDR-TB. One of the challenges that didn't come up is the fact that during the time that people don't have access to treatment, there's lots of transmission within families. And so um, in the early cohorts in Peru, for example, we had what we called TB families. A, you know, a quarter of the family, if the patients had multiple family members that had MDR-TB had multiple deaths in the family, and it's like this, you know, family trauma that goes on for, for years, and so that's a, an entirely new um, or separate uh, psychological issue. Um, the other thing, in, in terms of talking about these low-intensity in interventions, um, or basically um, task shifting and having lower-level people provide care, it's really trying to maximize the limited resources that, that we have. So if community health workers, there's a trial that just finished, a um, small trial in Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil, where they did, um, it was a, a three to five session intervention for depression by community health workers. They had three days of training and then biweekly supervision and they were able to achieve full remission in 30% of the cases and it was the same, it was no difference between that and enhanced treatment as usual. And so that's not to say that that's um, a standalone, right. which is also the same efficacy of, of many antidepressants. It's the first, usually people try one and then <laughs> around 30% respond. So the idea is not that that's the end, but if we can take out 30% that have, that are able to respond to the, to the low level intervention, then in three to five sessions, which is you know, one month, then we can you know, maximize the use of the specialists for the more severe and chronic cases that that really need uh, to take advantage of the specialized care. From the to be side arena, uh, I would suggest for working group to mental health and to be, to make suggestions or recommendations uh, to be taken by the NTPs or to be program elsewhere and globally. What type of instruments should be used to define depression, distress, uh, patient distress? So then we can have uh, comparable results and afterwards uh, to see what's the best uh, intervention, intervention can, should be tackled and used using evidence-based. I'm talking about implementation research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crucial for us because it's, it's not like uh, diabetes, you can collect blood. HIV is just HIV testing to the diagnose depression, which is what you said, for us, the clinician or healthcare workers, it's tough working from a side health, a mental, mental health arena. I would re recommend a very 
firmly that 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 suggests should be should be you, know, you could contact could NTP against what with the instrument they are using at a international level. Can I add on before you answer, Annika, because uh, that, that's a thought in my head as well, and, and a question also to Jerome uh, about the instrument. I mean, one way to see it is, is um, for re an instrument for research or operational research to get a better understanding, and the other question is about clinical use. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that particular instrument is it designed for research or for clinical use that can be used to identify what is needed exactly. So what Ernesto right. presented, psychological support, can do a big difference, right. but then it needs to be tailored. It's right. a bit like drug susceptibility testing. You know, so you mm -hmm. need to tailor your intervention according to what the problem is. So maybe you can reflect on that research versus implementation of programmatic uh, right. interventions. I, I just want, uh, well, I will say about the PHQ-9, um, and it wasn't a random choice for us. This has been validated um, for use by the Ministry of Health, <laughs> and um, in it, it, it should be used. The Ministry of Health. Um, should be applying it, but it's not consistent. And so we chose to use an instrument that we knew they could also, they would respond to the results and appreciate them because it was a tool that, that they themselves had validated and accepted. And it's, as far as I know, it's used um, both in research and in, in clinical practices. But there, there are many. We also use the SRQ, which is um, you know, commonly used, I think, in both settings as well. But I, I, I agree. Um, and the good thing is, is that um, we often say this in mental health implementation science is that it's it, it's not rocket science. I think that the work you're doing is a lot more difficult. <laughs> but I mean, it, it, for me, um, but 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 the fact that it's not rocket science um, just means to say, is not to belittle, belittle belittle it or trivialize it at all. It just means that we really do need to just say, okay, this is what we're going to do, or this is what we recommend. There's a question here. Place. Maybe the last question. We're at the end of the uh, session. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's uh, as much a comment as a question, which, uh, uh, but yeah, um, my name's Ian, Ian, I'm a researcher from the UK here. We've, um, it's great to have this, uh, this uh, symposium really, just focusing on this issue. I think it's such an important uh, sort of comorbidity with TB and it's great it's being recognised and I think furthering it is definitely needed. Uh, we've recently been doing some work in Nepal where we've, uh, where we've been testing the feasibility of, of some of the uh, low intensity interventions in MDR patients. Um, and so we've been using, uh, I think, a model you might be referring to from Vikram Patel, behavioral activation. Um, and, and we found it very positive, really. It's, uh, uh, we've been able to train uh, lay workers with uh, you know, a reasonable amount of education, but no counseling background uh, to deliver these with MDR patients and with some really kind of promising results and certainly looks like it's feasible and acceptable. So just kind of echoing really and supporting what you were saying in terms of some of these interventions are out there and they are feasible and, and doable in these situations. Uh, in our context, um, it was hard for the TB workers themselves to have the time to deliver it. So we actually needed to provide these as, if you like, counsellors within the service. And that's also a challenge because uh, some of these low intervention, although they're lower than other interventions, they still take some resource, and so uh, that was a challenge. But certainly they're really promising, and uh, it, it looks like there's uh, a lot of promise in these kind of interventions, and as you say, it's much needed. But the other comment just to make as well is we're kind of assuming that, that we have a basic idea of prevalence uh, in this population, and, and actually that's still an area that is really a gap. You know, we have small studies spread across the world, but we don't necessarily have larger studies to really get a grip on reporting substantially in terms of prevalence within TB populations, and that's, that's also a big need, although I agree that we need to be moving on to interventions as we're doing. So just a few comments to, to throw out, really. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right. Thank We're going to. Um, well, thanks very much for your presentation. All right. Thanks, everyone, for your uh, spirited conversation and participation. Thanks to the presenters uh, for that great variation, uh, really, across the spectrum of issues here. Um, and I, I'm glad to end on a, on, a, on a comment from you know, a best practice program being implemented in Nepal. We just heard one in Peru. And you know, there are these examples out there. And part of the Mental Health Working Group mission is to spread that information. Um, and, uh, and share it and, and start to move towards really implementing and systematizing this attention to identifying and treating mental disorders in the TB context. 
So uh, thanks very much. Knut, would you like to offer some no, closing just, remarks? Ju just support that. We need more evidence, but I think the, the, the route towards better evidence goes to now through implementation. So do the stuff, do it well, uh, evaluate and collect the data, and we will learn from that. Thanks very much. Enjoy the end of the conference.